Good afternoon, everyone. We are on class number 20 here today, and I thought we would work on two different things. Oh, I haven't actually recorded my class plan on the board here. I will do that right now. I thought we would work on number one, continuing our lessons on ethos. Ethos is the perception of trust and authority that you want to monitor regularly when you're trying to persuade somebody because, in part, you are a little bit more persuasive when you are consciously trying to build trust with your audience. There are a lot of different ways that you can build trust into a speech. We have already noted several of the ways that you can build trust into a speech. We will continue to learn ways to ensure trust. One of them is today. We're covering the importance of wording, of phrasing our ideas and more importantly, avoiding some certain, certain things that we're going to say when we're trying to persuade people. Because when we avoid certain things or we monitor them carefully, we are building trust with our audience. The other thing we're going to work on today is for our professional growth, our professional development overall as thinkers, as students, as professionals, perhaps in the workplace. What we're going to learn today is, I'm going to write our focus here, about cliches. Cliches are something that you want to be aware of as a presenter because you could cause your audience to roll their eyes and think less of you. Cliches are something to monitor regularly when you are presenting. They're also something to monitor regularly in any professional setting. Our focus is professional growth cliche game. I actually have invented here a game that we can use with our collaboration board to help us grow, to help us think through some expressions that A, we want to avoid, and B, what we should do instead. So focus, I missed that earlier uh, when I was preparing class here today. I forgot to write it on the board. I did remember to erase my board, so that's good. Uh, professional growth. Professional growth cliche game. I'm going to give you a game here today that you can play throughout class to help you grow in your perspective of how to build authority in your writing as well as in your dialogue in the workplace. You're going to sound a little bit more eloquent. By extension, you're going to be able to build a little bit more trust and authority with your audience. As you know by now, we do the overview with the first part of class here. Oh, I probably should record attendance. While I record attendance, are there any questions for me regarding our schedule, regarding our prior speech or speech is? Anything that you might have for me. I almost forgot to record our attendance here. Thank you, by the way, for your diligent attendance. I do monitor, I do reward attendance with our collaboration boards and our folder assignment. Those assignments count for 40% of your grade, just for making sure that you're in attendance, whether you're watching on YouTube or you're attending live. All right, let's do a for our overview here, if there are no questions, the first part of our overview or of any questions that you might have. The second part here is a timeline. I want you to visualize a timeline. If you'd like to actually write something out, you can. I'm trying to reserve our collaboration board here today for something special, something different. I don't want you to write on the collaboration board what we're about to do, but if you'd like to write it somewhere, maybe a post-it note. I have a post-it note here, and what I'm going to write for our overview, what you can write for your overview, is a timeline. Let's create a timeline really quickly here, it's not going to take too much time, a timeline for our semester thus far for this course, just to kind of see where we're at and where we're going. A quick perspective on progress, and work yet to be completed. 
on my timeline here, it's a rough timeline, <laughs> on my timeline here, I'm going to indicate that we are off until Wednesday. So I'm going to put here, no class, April 5th. So no class, April 5th. When we return from class, or when we return from break, rather, we have one, let me count them, one, two, three, four projects, four classroom topics left to complete. The first classroom topic is speech five. So we are still finishing speech number five. So on my timeline here, I've indicated speech five after the April 5th day that we have off. Speech five is also due, I'm gonna put here a note on that in parentheses for my timeline. You can visualize a timeline or you can write one out here with me right now. Speech five, the deadline is April 14th. We have more time for this speech than the others because it's longer and my expectations for your message and how you support that message are much higher than were the expectations for your previous speeches. One of the reasons for that is because we've learned more from the other speeches and now we can apply all of our development strategies to showcasing our skill set in speech number five. After speech five, we have speech six. That is our last speech of the semester. I believe the deadline for that is the 28th. Our classroom topics will shift to speech number six after we return from break here on April 5th. And then we still have two more topics left. The other topic that follows speech six is revision. You will, in fact, be allowed to revise your speeches. If one of them needs to be revised, we're going to talk about strategies for avoiding revision. We're also going to talk about meaningful strategies for revising index cards, for revising outlines, for revising your approach to planning a speech. Everything revision is going to be a classroom topic following speech number six. We're going to conclude with a final lesson on the folder. That'll be our last class or classes of the semester on this folder, which is due April 5th. April 5th, you will have you, I'm sorry, not April 5th, uh, May 7th, May 7th. I don't know what I was thinking about with it. Oh, April 5th was our, our day off Monday. May 7th, May 7th is the day that your folder is due. A collection of all your speeches, all your collaboration boards, and anything else related to the course. On our timeline here, we can kind of imagine what came before. We had speech number one through four, and we also had 19 collaboration boards. Today's number 20, our 20th class. All those collaboration boards need to be organized in your folder assignment. Joseph brought up a really good point last class, which is having those pictures organized in a Google Drive folder. And then on your table of contents in your folder, all you have to do is have a single link to your collaboration boards. Audiences can click on that single link and it takes them to all your collections of pictures. By this point, you need 19. There are 19 pictures, one representative for each class of what you wrote out during that class, evidence of your participation in that class. All right, that was our little timeline here for help us, helping us think about where, we're, where we were and where we are and where we're going. Let's warm up with an A through C warm-up exercise. The first one is I want us to <laughs> I want us to play a little bit a little game here today and it'll be trust me it'll be incredibly valuable for you as a learner. For instance for instance there are some expressions that we probably have heard as we listen to ourselves on video. It happens all the time. I see myself on camera and sometimes I'm horrified. <laughs> and normally it's by what I say. I just, I don't like some of the things I say. I know you don't like some of the things you say either. Comments, mannerisms, and cliches. Today we're focusing on cliches. Some things that we say that we don't like, that we'd like to improve on, that we'd like to plan out of our speeches. 
I'm thinking of an example here as I reviewed some of my classroom videos from the last week. And what are some that I like to say? I like to say at the end of the day. And I, I know that's a cliche. And I know it's overused. And I know that it somehow makes me sound a little bit less authoritative. So at the end of the day is an example of an expression that I perhaps use too much. I probably also use the expression too much informed by, informed by. We're all guilty of overusing an expression. And what we're going to learn today are A, some expressions that we're guilty of overusing, and B, some that we want to use instead to help us sound a little bit more authoritative. What we're going to do is create a blank for our collaboration board. We can start by labeling collaboration board 20. Collaboration board number 20. And we're going to create a blank kind of like game. In this game, we're going to work with different expressions that is going to require a different phrase. For instance, a phrase that I heard the other day that I'm kind of getting really tired of hearing, and that's the danger of cliches. We'll have an entire lesson where we explore some of the dangers of cliches, and we're going to include those on our collaboration board here. I would say somewhere on your collaboration board, include a square or a key. Oh, yep, yeah, Kiana? Yes, um, I should have asked this right when class started, but um, how long is our, our Air Force speech? Oh. How long is that one supposed to be? How many minutes? Oh, which, which speech, Kiana? Uh, the, the one that we're working on right now. This speech is seven to ten minutes. Okay, thank you. Seven to ten minutes, and it is due on April 14th. April 14th. All right, so somewhere on your collaboration board, I would say towards the bottom, create like a little key, a little square. Now I'm going to do that on the right-hand side of my page. So this is going to be my little key. Most games, and we're going to create a little game here today, a visual game. <laughs> Most games have a place where the instructions are included. And we are going to do no different here today. That square is going to represent my instructions. And I can label that instruction or instructions. These instructions are going to include What's wrong with cliches? Why should we avoid cliches? What are we supposed to look out for? Part of a game is what to look out for. What are, why are we supposed to look out for? That's going to all be a part of this. This is an example of the game that I'm thinking of. <laughs> so if you look at this picture here, right, we have all of these blank uh, squares here, all of these blank cubes. We also have a set of instructions towards the bottom of our game that's going to tell us about these cliches. Now, each one of these squares is going to have a different cliche that we want to work through. What could we say instead? It's going to help us prepare for that situation so that the next time we catch ourselves saying it, we're going to remember this lesson. Moreover, we're going to let, remember something to say instead or something to do instead. Sometimes the presence of the cliche is okay. But what you can recognize as a speaker is the need to follow it. If you simply leave that expression there, you lose some credibility with your audience. For example, I had this one highlighted, underlined, and bolded in my notes for today. I am so tired of hearing it. I'm so tired of hearing it. And that's one of the dangers of using a cliche. Just because of one expression you use, you can actually you can actually steer your audience away from you. Your audience will likely think less of you. The expression is hardworking. I hear that way too often. Hardworking this, hardworking that. And the more I hear it, the less, <laughs> the less I'm impressed by it. The less your audience is impressed by this expression that you've used. Now, there are some strategies you could follow hardworking with an explanation. And that's part of this 
important lesson here today is when I use hard working, there's nothing wrong with that per se. Um, there's nothing wrong with that if, as long as I follow it. If I say this person is hard working, and by the way, that means this. How do you know to follow hard working, however? Well, that's what our lesson today is so important for, is as soon as you hear an expression moving forward that you know is probably a little bit too overused, you will have the recognition and the resources needed to actually steer that conversation back to where it needs to be, to steer that presentation back to where it needs to be so that your audience doesn't lose faith in you and you continue to build credibility with your audience because you're avoiding cliches or you're explaining cliches. Let's create our game with like the starting point and then we can fill it in as we go. I have a key here, that's the instructions. The first one that I'm going to need to create a little square is start. We need to have a start. <laughs> so I'm going to create a little square here that says start. And then the very first square is going to be an example of how this game works. After start, I can put in the next square, which is going to be hard working. That's an example of a cliche that I know I've used before. Hardworking is an example of an overused expression. You never, you never just say hardworking. You say somebody is hardworking. And when you say somebody is hardworking, that's a cliche. But hardworking is an example of a cliche. The very next square, this is how this game is going to work, is what do you say instead? So instead of hardworking, what you can say instead is exactly what you mean. When you hear hard working, the next square in your dialogue should be exactly what you mean. Hard working means never missed a class in four years, or never missed a day of work in a year, or never clocked in late, or never failed to turn in a project on time. That is what you mean by hard working. The ability to follow that cliché, to recognize that cliché, is a way to further build authority with an audience. There are lots of clichés that speakers use, and if you use them and don't follow them with the next square, you could lose a lot of credibility with your audience, just like with hardworking. If you simply stop there and say, this person is hardworking, and then you move on and you assume your audience knows what that means, it actually loses a lot of meaning because people have overused it. A cliche is an overused expression. We're going to explore all that today. Right now we're just setting it up and we have now set up our collaboration board for today. You don't have to write anything else on there <laughs> uh, for now. Let's move forward with, now that we've warmed up here, we have an idea of what our collaboration board is going to be for today. It's going to be for playing this little game of professional development, of self-improvement, a self-improvement collaboration board. And yes, a game. Let's review by thinking through carefully what is meant by a cliché. And let's include that in the instructions because it's what we want to watch out for. It's what we're going to put in the starting square and then follow with the next square, a solution. We're not at the solution yet. Why is this review? Well, this is review because I know you've heard this word before. Therefore, I want you to review your collective knowledge, your collective experience of what you already know about the word cliché and explain it. What is a cliché? In the instructions here, number one is know what a cliché is. And then you're going to provide a definition. You can't play a game on cliches without knowing what a cliché is. So how would you explain a cliché to somebody who has no idea? Someone who has no idea. Review your knowledge. Review every instance in which you've heard this expression before. This, Sorry, this word. You've, you've heard this word before. Uh, cliché. I would call it an overused phrase. It can't be one word. One word can't be a cliché. I know 
you're probably thinking he has one word on the board there in his game. Well, you never just say hardworking. You say this person is hardworking or I am hardworking, which is a phrase. Am hardworking. He is hard. Well, that would be an expression. Um, it's probably best to just call it an expression. Let's call it an overused expression. In this case, the expression hardworking. I am hardworking. Or I am a people person. We probably hear that too, uh, too many times as well. Uh, but it's an overused expression that is really just, it's kind of boring and it's also kind of dangerous because your audience will lose a little bit of faith in you. They'll think to themselves, you really maybe don't have the ability to be clear, to clarify, to think eloquently, to think originally. But in short, if I were to define a cliche, I'm thinking of all the different resumes that I've read. That's another place where I see a lot of cliches, not just in presentations when I'm sitting there listening to someone, but also on resumes. I read a lot of cliches. And that gives me understanding then that a cliche is an overused expression. The first lesson I gained here today was one I want you to remember if nothing else. It's that it's not a matter of deleting the cliché. That's really almost impossible. Our language is filled with expressions that we learn when we're talking to people, when we're in classes, when we're reading. And I think clichés actually, I mean, they can make writing sound, they can make our conversation sound a little bit more humble, a little bit more uh, personable. But the lesson that I opened with was follow it. Don't stop there. Why would you stop there, especially when you know there was a question about how long this speech is? It's seven to ten minutes. It's our longest one. You owe it to yourself when you hear a cliche that you're using to follow it. And what does that do? You're winning back trust with your audience. You're showing them that you can think for yourself. More importantly, you're actually filling that presentation with a meaningful lesson. A lesson on what hard working really means. And then you've doubled up on the information for your audience. You've given them information beyond just your lesson, information on what this word actually means, which can be incredibly valuable for an audience privileged enough to be a part of your presentation. But recognition is key. Hopefully after today, you've thought more carefully about this expression of hard working, but we're gonna explore a lot more cliches than just that. But think overused expression overused expression. The next part of our review here is to provide an example. So the first part was an overused expression. We're creating these instructions for our game. Know what a cliche is. That's step number one in this game. Know what a cliche is. It's an overused expression. And then next we need an example. So think long and hard about, or even Maybe you have quick access to your previous speech. Maybe you pull up your previous speech and you find, you listen for a cliche until you hear one. If I'm thinking of a cliche that I've heard recently, I'm thinking of a presentation. <sighs> the last presentation I was involved in, I'm trying to, well, maybe it, for our review here, I wanted it to be a cliche that you use, so let's, let's stick to that. So our last part of our review here is we're reviewing our own dialogue, our own self-directed speech, presentations, maybe even writing. What's an expression that you're guilty of? Use that as an example of an overused expression. Something to really think through carefully here today. Overused expression. Overused expression. Uh -huh. I have one. I have one. You're going to probably nod and say, yes, Mr. Hike is guilty of that one. And I'm, I'm human, right? I make mistakes. I'm not... Teachers are, teachers are not... <laughs> 
Uh, pe we're people like everybody else, right? Sometimes there's this idea of mystery regarding a teacher, but I'm a human being. I, you know, when I get home, I still have, I still have chores to do. I still have, I still have cooking to do, cleaning to do. I'm, I'm just like everybody else. I, I'm not by any means, um, perfect. <laughs> and one that I know I use is great presentation. That's a cliche. When I keep saying great presentation, great presentation, that's a cliche. It's an overused expression. That's a great presentation. Or that's a great speech. Already, already you've learned today what to do. Follow it. Don't just stop there. Great presentation. By that I mean you gave me a lesson that I can apply immediately to my life tomorrow to help me be better at X. That would be an example of how you could expound on great presentation or great speech. But certainly the expression great presentation, great speech, you know you've heard me use that perhaps way too many times. And in that sense, I could improve that cliche <laughs> by following it, explaining it. All right, uh, the next item for us to work on here is, I guess before we move on, we should probably finish these instructions. How does this game work? Number one is know what a cliche is. Number two is write the cliche in the first box. Or the first cube, we can call them a cliche. Uh, um, we can call them a cube. So write a cliche you're guilty of using. If it's going to work as professional growth, they have to be cliches you're guilty of using yourself. Like hard working and great presentation. I'm guilty of using those. So write a cliche you're guilty of using. In a cube. In the very next cube, write the explanation. You can call it the fix. <laughs> so in the next cube, I'll say explanation. In the next cube, write your explanation. And then you repeat all of this until you get to the finish. We won't be finished until we filled our collaboration board. Just like this example shows the entire collaboration board complete. Right? There's really no space left. We won't be finished until we get our entire board filled. So in the next cube, write your explanation. Repeat. Repeat until board is filled. And then for hard working, I'm going to go back to that one. <laughs> so what would be the next cube? I left it blank. I would probably say instead, if I were using this in a in dialogue, professional dialogue, a presentation, I said, this person is hard working. By that I mean John or Jane hasn't used a single day off. That's hard working. Or probably more so they have never failed to turn in a project on time. So never fail to turn in a project on time. If you just stopped at hard working, you would run two risks. Number one, your audience not really knowing what you mean and missing that second point, which is, that's what you actually meant. And number two, them losing faith in you because they might roll their eyes and think, here we go again, another person who's hardworking, thanks for that. <laughs> You've lost some credibility. There's some shine that's gone away on you as a presenter. 
All right, now that we have an understanding of how our collaboration board is going to work here today, let's talk. Our discussion question is, what are some dangers of cliches beyond those that I've already covered? What are some of the notable dangers of cliches, specifically? This is just talk. You don't have to actually write these down. We can just talk about them. The first one I mentioned was, it's not actually what you mean. When you really think about it, that's not specifically what you meant. If I say, for instance, this person is a great communicator, is that the extent of what you meant? Are they a great communicator? Or is it that they're always positive, friendly, and can talk for extended periods of time while looking at somebody and not looking at their phone? Is that what you mean by great communicator? Great communicator is, is insufficient. That cliche is insufficient. It is the explanation that follows that actually adds the needed, the needed clarification on great communicator. So when we really think about a cliche, one of the dangers is they don't actually say exactly what we think. We need that following explanation to say what we think. Over time, the more practiced you become as a presenter, likely you won't use these cliches in the first place. Now, there's nothing wrong with using them. I hope that that is clear. You can use them. It's just the idea, don't miss the opportunity to follow and explain them. Don't miss that opportunity. Number one is they're not, they're not as specific. They don't actually capture what you actually think they do. Not if you don't take the time to explain them. Number two is you can aggravate your audience. They've heard them too many times and they will roll their eyes and think, I, here we go again. I've heard that before. Another one is, I've had years of experience with teaching cliches, not just in my public speaking classes, but also in my writing classes. And one thing that, one thing that I have my writers be aware of is distraction. It's already distracting enough when you're reading a paper, when you're just trying to focus on the information. Readers have enough distractions as they process a paper or information. You want to minimize as many distractions as possible. And when you use a cliche, here's the problem with that, is it is distracting because we have experiences with language, each one of us, that takes us to the first time we heard this or a circumstance in which we heard it, or the most favorable place in which we heard it. For instance, with hard working, I'm reminded of growing up with my dad telling us, teaching us when we were working in his woodworking shop, the importance of being hard working. My dad would often say, it is the people who are hard working that really get ahead. And he would commonly show us and preach to us the importance of being, hard, being a hard worker. But when I see the word and when I experience the phrase, this person is hard working, I'm reminded of growing up and working in my dad's woodworking shop and I'm reminded of witnessing my dad as a hard worker. Or if I hear the expression, great communicator, I am taken back to my psychology class when I was at Dickinson State University and I was struck in talking to my classmates about how great of a communicator our psychology teacher was. This person was polished. This person was eloquent. When you say great communicator, I'm reminded instantly of that class. Those reminders are a form of distraction. They take us away from your message and they actually take us to this time and place where we had the greatest experience with this phrase. Those of you who've had psychology, incidentally, it's like a conditioned response. We have a conditioned response to this expression. When we hear it, it's actually taking us away from you and it's taking us to a different place. And sometimes we're going to come back, but sometimes we're going to be a little too distracted. If you immediately follow that expression, the likelihood of us being distracted as an audience goes down. Number one, we had, it's not very, it's not telling us exactly what you think. 
Number two with the danger of cliche is they can frustrate your audience. Number three is they can actually be distracted, distracting because they remind audiences of different time and places. They have a conditioned response. They have a conditioned response to that expression. We all have experiences with language and no, through no fault of our own, when we hear that, we can kind of be reminded of a different time and place, like hardworking in my dad's woodworking shop and him teaching us the importance of being somebody responsible, somebody who did work hard. What else with cliches? Discussion questions, by the way, they don't have one clear answer. What are some other dangers? I have three. I think they can be overcomplicated. I think they can be overcomplicated in the sense that when you say, what's another example? I have a whole list here that I printed off in preparation for class. So number four, I'm working with the idea that a cliche can actually, it can actually be, actually be overcomplicated. And we all know that, <laughs> we've all heard the expression, keep it simple. We've all heard that. We all believe in keep it simple. When you are using a cliche, it's actually a way of not keeping it simple. It's a way of being a little bit too complicated. Because if you use the number, for example, a number is a solution. If you actually indicated your idea numerically, you almost always, have a better, something more meaningful to say. I'm looking here, I have this whole list of cliches that I printed off in preparation for class here today. I don't know how many I'm guilty of, but I'm probably guilty of many of them. And I'm trying to find one that I can use as an example. Because, keep it simple. A cliche is actually not simple. A cliche is actually more complicated than if you used a number, for example. If you try to relay your information with numbers to actually clarify what you mean, then it's a little bit, it's simpler. It's simpler, which is usually a victory in life. <laughs> uh, Uh, think outside the box. I know I've used that one with challenging my students to be a little bit more original. I want them to think outside the box. And that's actually a pretty complicated way of saying to somebody, innovate or be, be yourself, be you, do you. That's another, <laughs> do you is another cliche, do you. What does that actually mean, do you? That's a new one that we like to use, do you. I think it's still new enough that it still has a little bit of attraction to it, the expression, do you. But if I think of something simpler than do you, like, like be you, be yourself, be yourself, be you, be original, be your own thinker. Um, I think it's the explanation that is perhaps the solution there with be simple. Like rather than be a little bit too grandiose with do you, I have no problem with that. And I don't want you to take out all the cliches. I don't want you to take out any cliches, just follow them with an explanation. So when I hear the expression, do you, it's an example to follow that expression with your own explanation. I was, I was having us think of numbers. Like it seems most often a lot of these cliches can be managed with numbers, which is always simpler. Like with hard working, that one lends itself to numbers. Think outside the box. I don't know that that one lends itself to numbers, or do you? I don't know that that lends itself to numbers. Maybe, think outside the box, how could I have a number there for that? Which is simpler, that's the idea. When you keep it simple, a cliche is actually a little more complicated than it might seem on the surface. I 
I don't know what the numbers would be there, but with hard working, the simple way of saying that is never used one day, that's the number, one day of vacation time. That is a little bit simpler than hard working. I don't know, think outside the box. I mean, in terms of like, what's a number, what's a simpler way of saying that? All right, let me kind of recount here from our discussion question. The discussion question, what are some dangers of cliches specifically? And number one was they aren't actually what you mean. When you take the time to explain what you mean, you'll be surprised at how infrequent a cliche actually does say what you mean. It's the explanation that follows which indicates what you mean. What you mean. Number two is they can be aggravating, they can frustrate your audience, they can, that's probably the worst one actually. Can you imagine somebody who has heard the expression all week, do you, and they're just another presentation where they hear that? You could actually aggravate your audience unless you actually took the time to follow it and say, by this expression, by the way, I'm just trying to say this. And then number three is distraction because your audience is going to be taken unintentionally to a time and place when they first heard this or they had the greatest experience with that expression. And then the last one is they're not actually simple. The simple, keep it simple, is to actually just explain that expression in a straightforward objective way, usually with numbers. If you can somehow explain it with a number, that's preferable. And we're going to try that with a lot of our cliches that we're going to put on the board here. We're going to try to indicate that with a number. All right, our quiz question for today is an, o an oral quiz. An oral quiz. Our text does treat cliches. If you don't have the text, by now you know you don't need to have the text. The cliches are covered also under the heading of powerless language. Powerless language. I know we've covered that in a prior class, but we're going to revisit it here today. What does our text say about powerless language? It's an oral quiz. Don't write anything down. Just maybe answer to your screen if you want. What is this explanation of powerless language? Powerless language. Well, let's take a look. See what we can find before we play our game here. We're going to try to fill out the entire board with cliches using perhaps ourselves. We can think through expressions that we know we're guilty of, we use all the time, and I know I'm going to have a lot of them. <laughs> not to not use them. That's not the point today. The point is to follow them just like in our game. We're going to follow them with an explanation with the correct practice. Powerless language. Let's take a look at what our book says about powerless language or an online source if you don't have the book. It says avoid powerless language, a section on powerless language. It says to enhance the clarity of your speech and to increase your perceived credibility, right? it is important that you avoid powerless language in your speeches. That perfectly summarizes every, everything we've, we've discussed here in class thus far. Powerless language refers to words and phrases that reduce the clarity and exactness of your message. I think what's important here as we learn what our text says about powerless language is to come back to the need to not eliminate them. I think that would be a fruitless endeavor. That's an example of a cliche, fruitless endeavor. Uh, but I'm not going to completely dismiss fruitless endeavor. It's there. Now I can just explain it. By fruitless endeavor, I mean a challenge to undertake that you might not ever be able to completely overcome. It's not a challenge that you can completely overcome. That challenge will keep coming up again and again because language, that's the inherent nature of language. Language is imperfect. All of these different boxes that we have to use to express our ideas, they're there. We didn't necessarily get a choice of these boxes, those words to express every sophisticated idea we have. 
But those are the boxes that we have. And yes, we can choose better boxes, ones that look a little bit more attractive, ones that maybe are a little bit more sound for our ideas. But the nature of language is thus that we have this limited vocabulary to work with. But recognition of cliches means we have opportunity. We have opportunity to say a little bit more and an opportunity to actually win favor back with our audience just by kind of smiling and recognizing we've used a cliche as they did there with fruitless endeavor, right? I used fruitless endeavor, I knew it was a cliche, and it gave me a chance to kind of laugh and maybe hearten myself to the audience a little bit um, to show that I'm... Now, um, um is an example, I just said um. I don't use um very often, but... <laughs> um is a non-word filler, it's not a cliche. Just to make a distinction here, a cliche is an actual word, phrase, not to be confused with non-word fillers. Um is a non-word filler. How about you know? I've heard, you know is an example of a filler, but it's also a cliche. You know, you know, you know. <laughs> I'm putting that one up here because I've heard that one probably the most this semester is, I've used it as well, you know. Maybe it's just that I'm catching it more this semester, that you know, you know, you know. Catch yourself. You say you know, it's a cliche. Follow it. Follow it and explain it. By you know, I'm simply encouraging you to realize this is a subject you may have heard in high school, you may have heard in a prior college class. You could say that instead. It is an opportunity. A cliche is an opportunity. It's not a defeat. It's not a defeat of your skills as a presenter. Quite the contrary. It is an opportunity there to endear your audience to you when you kind of laugh about it and to also add a little bit more information to your speech. Powerless language, powerless language. It says, instead of saying these, say this. It looks like our text with regards to powerless language Oh, it does cover what are called the filler, filler sounds, filler sounds. It categorizes these as hesitations, which are under the heading of powerless language. It calls them hesitations. Hesitations are filler words or filler sounds that are unintentionally added in a speech. Some examples of hesitations are ah, like, um, well, you know, you know, you know is an example of a hesitation which is under the larger heading of powerless language. It also has jargon. It says you, jargon is the special language of a particular activity, business, or group of people. No, I'm sorry, it's not under powerless language. Jargon is something else entirely. Oh, don't get me wrong. There's another one here. Don't get me wrong is another example of a cliche. Kind of, I think, pretty much. I'm going to leave this section of the book open because those are some great cliches to kind of work with during our collaboration exercise here, which we can move into right now. We've had an oral quiz, what is powerless language? You can Google it or you can use your book here. Let's collaborate now. That is activity number six here. I wanna cover before we collaborate some strategies. I have a lot of strategies that I don't know that I've covered here. Maybe I put them on a post-it. You can put them on a post-it as well. Before we actually play this game here, working through cliches that we're guilty of using, Let's take a look at some strategies. These are, well, maybe I put those in, I don't know that I have room up here. I don't have room in my key. I'd love to have room, but I don't. 
What does it say in the, in the next cube? Write your explanation. I'd love to revise that because these, I'm going to revise that because, or maybe I put these strategies over here. Let me put the strategies over here, a new set of strategies. Instructions, these are the instructions. I'm going to briefly take those instructions that were here and put them over here so I have more room on my game board. Uh, maybe these are the extended instructions. Let's do it like that. <laughs> these are the extended instructions, the advanced instructions for the expert version of the game. So these are for the expert version. Extended instructions. The extended, is extended instructions, I'm going to use a bullet point rather than numbers. And I'm going to say other strategies to use. Other strategies for managing a cliche. When you get to a box where you have a cliche, these are other strategies. Or you hear a cliche in your presentation. On the spot, these are strategies that you can use. You'll become more and more confident with them the more practiced you become. Other strategies for managing, the, managing cliches. Number one is I touched on it. I didn't actually take the time to write it out as a strategy. It's try to use a number. It doesn't get more specific than that. A problem with cliches is they're not specific. Well, the opposite of specific is a number. You can't get more specific than a number. So try to use numbers whenever possible. It's not always possible. I was humbled by think outside the box. I didn't really have a clear number that that expression was directing me towards. I could have said maybe try to use, I don't know, more strategies for thinking, more, try to use 10 strategies, 10 new strategies for helping you, I don't know, write this email. If it were, I was asking them to think outside their email or think outside the box with the way they're problem solving this client complaint. I say, think outside the box with this complaint. That means maybe come up with 10 new strategies for resolving this conflict. You can try to use numbers. If you think in terms of numbers, they're more specific. The next one I have for strategies, the extended strategies for managing cliches and building trust with your audience because they can see you thinking for yourself. They recognize your, your, your uh, humility, your, your human, your, your human when you actually recognize the cliche and follow it is maybe have a healthy pause. You can't use that one up there, but you can use it in real conversation. It, or not, not real conversation, but a live presentation. You can pause. Was that all of them? Use a number. Oh, use a one-word replacement. A synonym. A simple synonym. If you don't like the long, drawn-out explanation that follows... You can use a synonym, a quick synonym. Think outside the box, innovate. I think that one works for that. <laughs> Sometimes different cliches lend themselves to different strategies. A one word substitute, by saying it said, think outside the box, by that I mean innovate. That would be a one word replacement that I would encourage my audience to keep in mind, not that cliche. All right, I think I've exhausted my strategies here. I mean, if it were a, a paper, you could delete it and not use it in the first place. Obviously, when you're talking, you can't delete that cliche. It's there. You've just said it. Now you can follow it. You can use a one-word replacement. You can use numbers, or you can provide that extended explanation. All right, I think we're ready to play now. Let's take a look here at some cliches that we're guilty of, and let's see how many boxes we can fill. Uh, 
if we're thinking forward, I love thinking forward, and we're trying to persuade our audience to take our position, if we're really trying to convince an audience of something, what are some expressions that we're probably going to want to use? We're just probably going to go to them. I wrote some down here. Um, like if we're trying to persuade somebody that... I'll use the example of Novak Djokovic. Novak Djokovic is the best tennis player ever. I think if you say this is, this is an undeniable fact, that's a cliche. Undeniable fact. You might want to use that expression. Oh, I have you know first. I have to follow you know first. So the rule is, once you put a cliche in a cube, you have to find an explanation that follows that cliche before you can introduce a new cliche in your game, before you get to the finish line. Now, for you know, what would be a great following explanation to use with you know. As soon as you hear you know, you've been guilty of using it, now you want to follow it with something else. I think when you're using you know, you're trying to like build this <laughs> You're trying to encourage your audience, and maybe just say, by that I'm trying to encourage you, by that I'm trying to encourage you to see, so I'm trying to encourage you I wrote, instead of, or after, you know, I would still use you know. There's nothing wrong with a cliche as long as you recognize it and follow it to win your audience back. I hear you know, I'm recording myself on camera giving this presentation. Oh my gosh, I just used you know. But with this game, I've practiced this circumstance. By that, I'm trying to encourage you to see your own expertise on the subject. Because when you say you know, you're trying to encourage your audience to rely on their own expertise in some form. If you say, you know, it's like this, that's a way of telling your audience, you have expertise on this subject as well. Let's find it. Let's find your own expertise, your own expertise in the form of an experience. But using instead, Let's find your own expertise. I'm, by you know, I'm trying to encourage you to find your own expertise. It's like that moment in your life when this happened. That would be something I could use instead of, you know, to follow it with an explanation of, an explanation meant to encourage my audience to find their expertise. Other, the other one I was working with was undeniable fact. <laughs> Undeniable fact. If I did say thinking forward to my persuasive speech, this is an undeniable fact. <laughs> I mean, that's kind of condescending as well, in one light. You, if you said this is an undeniable fact, it's, it's a little bit insensitive to your audience. But let's pretend it came up. You said that's an undeniable fact. Novak Djokovic has been ranked number one longer as a male tennis player, number one than any other male tennis player. That's an undeniable fact. By that I mean... Uh, I don't know that you could say much after that. Maybe just... It's an impressive number. You could say it's, it's an impressive... That's also a cliché. That's a danger. You follow it with another cliché. 
um, is maybe we should appreciate that. It's an undeniable fact. Maybe you encourage your audience, let's, let's appreciate this statistic. So try to, let's appreciate this statistic. So let's appreciate this statistic. Let's, yeah, let's appreciate that statistic for a moment, rather than say it's an undeniable fact, you can follow that. By that I mean, let's just take the time to appreciate this statistic, that Novak Djokovic has been ranked number one longer than any other male tennis player, rather than be condescending and say this is an undeniable fact. All right, let's take a look at some more here. I'm really encouraging you now to think about your pra your last speech. Think about your special occasion speech. What were some expressions that you used that you wish you wouldn't have? I can play the game of look at my own classes and what was one that I, I came? Oh, a great presentation. So great presentation, I use that a lot. Great presentation. A great presentation. Meaning, if you don't want to use the expression, which can also be overused, by that I mean meaning. You could say great presentation. Meaning, meaning what? Meaning... I followed the expression, the overused expression that I'm guilty of, of great presentation with meaning there was a message I found original. There was a message I found original. I love it when I learn new things. We all do. Innately, we all love learning new things. And when we feel like we are learning something new from start to finish, that's a great presentation. Other things that I know I've been guilty of saying in my classes, or I can also look at some cliches from the, I printed off a whole bunch here. <laughs> um, level of distraction. Level of distraction can be another one. So a certain level of distraction, I'm thinking of attacking smartphones. If somebody is getting on somebody for using their smartphone, they might say it caused a certain level of distraction. By that, it, it kind of disrupted the attention that other people deserve. It disrupts that attention. So I could follow it with, it disrupts attention. I'm really, really searching my memory here. There, I'm trying to think of ones that are really, like, truly frustrating as an audience that you hear. Ones that are truly frustrating. Maybe we all agree. I don't like it when someone says we, we would all agree. Because that assumes they know me. And when somebody assumes they know me, it's kind of disrespectful in that they're basically saying I have no individuality, <laughs> which is not cool, right? So 
we all agree. This would be such a great opportunity to immediately win your audience back. You, you know you've heard the expression, we would all agree or we all agree. This is a place where if you hear that cliche, you could immediately follow it with an explanation that audiences will then feel like, yes, you get it, it's an overused expression, thank you for taking the time to explain it and build your authority back with me, your trust back with me. And we would all agree, of course, by this, I'm simply saying that, by this, I'm, of course, by this, I'm saying, we all agree, or we would all agree. Of course, by this I'm saying, how would you say that in a way that isn't disrespectful to your audience immediately? Uh, it's, an, it's an overused expression. By this I mean, of course, not everyone but most. Maybe, maybe that. Of course, by this I mean, by this I'm saying not everyone. But we all agree. By this, of course, I'm saying most, but not everyone, and indiv individuality is, is encouraged. We're all still encouraged to have our individuality to look at things from different perspectives. Different perspectives is a cliche. I don't, I don't dislike different perspectives, but it is an example of a cliche. So different perspectives. Different perspectives. Views equal in value. Maybe views equal in value. These, val these views all have equalness. So views equal in value. So views equal in value. Views equal in value. Oh, I'm here today. I'm here today to do something. <laughs> Meaning, my objective is to persuade. Rather than, I'm here today to give a persuasive speech, I'm here today is the expression. I'm here today to do blank. I'm here today to... Rather than that, you can just explain exactly what it is you're trying to do. You're trying to deliver a persuasive speech on this. I'm delivering, or I am delivering, a persuasive speech. Or you could even say, I'm here to use seven minutes of your valuable time to convince you that Novak Djokovic is the greatest tennis player of all time. Rather than say, I'm here today to give a persuasive speech, you say, I'm here today, but I'm here today to give a persuasive speech, which means I'm going to use seven minutes of your time to convince you that Novak Djokovic is the greatest tennis player of all time. What else for a speech? Wanted to kind of <laughs> uh, fill my game here. Oh, uh, what are some other ones? What are some, I know the expression, I mean, we can play around with that one, the do you expression, do you. I have nothing wrong with that one. I think that one is actually pretty clever and witty. But it does warrant a little explanation. So if you said, do you... Do 
By this, I mean Maybe by this I mean you are as powerful, meaningful as everyone else. You are just as powerful. I'm trying to think of when I would use that. I mean, that is what you're trying to say. By this I mean you are as powerful as the next person. You just have to realize it. So by this I mean you are powerful. Okay, you are just as capable of power as the next person, as the next person. All right, I'm getting close. My game is getting there. I'm getting there. <laughs> uh, Maybe the expression, thank you all. I like to use that one a lot in my classes as well. And maybe I could jazz it up a little bit. So thank you all. So thank you all. Which I'm really saying, which I'm really saying what? Which I'm really saying... I value your commitment to learning, which I really say I value your commitment to learning. In a presentation, if the audience stays with you to the end, that's kind of what they did. They showed you their commitment to learning, their commitment to looking at a subject from a different point of view. All right, I'm getting there. I'm getting there. I'm close. I probably just need a couple more here. Let's see if my sheet can help me out. I know I've heard this one, and it's one from this week that kind of, a person of honor, like this person is honorable. Like that's just overused. Honorable. What does it mean to say someone's honorable? What's great about cliches and your explanation of them is only you know what you really meant to use by that word in the first place. Therefore, you're the expert on its explanation in that context. So when you say this person is honorable, you're the expert on honorable in that instance. What does honorable mean to you about this person in that instance. So when I say it was an honorable to think, or this person was honorable, this person was honorable, by this I mean, or if I get tired of using by this I mean, I'm going to use that as a cliche too, by this I mean, but specifically, specifically, This person valued rules. This person valued rules with, their, with all their actions. This person valued rules. Specifically, this person valued rules for social engagement, for the workplace, for driving, this person valued rules. Therefore, they were honorable. This person really valued rules. They valued rules throughout their life. Rules for social conduct, rules for workplace etiquette, rules for commuting. <laughs> they valued now, no, I'm not taking away this word either. The word honorable still stays there. It's just I'm following it. I'm explaining it. I think we can... I, I can't really go around again. So I'm going to 
put the finish line here for my cliche professional development growth game. So I'm going to put finish here. Simply because I can't go anywhere else. I kind of ran myself into the end of my, of my collaboration board there. The short of today's lesson is just pay attention to expressions that are overused. Watch some of your presentations. If you're annoyed by it, then probably your audience will be as well. But don't be too hard on yourself. Realize that that's a missed opportunity to take some pressure off yourself for managing the time. By explaining that expression, you're actually taking a lot of the pressure off yourself for filling that presentation time with meaningful content, meaningful content, and winning favor back with your audience. All right, we have a little bit of time here left, and I had a couple of different tasks for us to complete. Oh, yeah, this one's good. Uh, let's take a look at the rubric here. This could be our finish one thing if time runs out. Where does the rubric talk about cliches or where would cliches fall in the rubric that's actually used to score our speeches. Let's take a look at the rubric that has been in all of our assignment sheets. It's the same one. It's my table for communicating what usually happens in a good speech. So let's take a look at that table and see what we can learn. If I can find it here somewhere. Well, that's that. Okay. So the rubric, let's see where it says something about, I thought I printed it off. I thought I printed off the speech for today. Well, I have it on my device here. I'll pull it up on my device. We're looking at the rubric and seeing where it talks about cliches. I don't know that it's specifically going to mention cliches, but we're going to try to figure out where it would fall. It doesn't fall under course theme. It doesn't fall under message. It doesn't fall under crediting or source use. Uh, probably genre. It can fall under genre. This is the this is the total assessment of this speech meeting the expectations audiences have for a great speech. And in part, a great speech is most certainly judged on the perception of eloquence, the perception of the speaker speaking using the clearest phrases, the most straightforward phrases, the absence of phrases that could frustrate or annoy. In short, genre is a judgment category for the total quality of the speech. Thus, genre could be one place where we could say cliches would fall. Another one is disruption. A cliche could be a form of a disruption, as we noted. Probably not so much there. Probably simply, I would say, the genre. Specifically, it says the style and tone and rhetorical modes fit genre. Rhetorical modes are just your different purposes. They're your different purposes for a line of reasoning within a speech. A purpose could be to tell a story. A purpose could be to compare and contrast. Those purposes should, those purpose should, purpose is, should match the type of speech that you're giving. So I think genre. I think genre and specifically style and tone is where cliches would fall. All right, I think we covered enough for today. The only thing I'm going to add is if you did not get me your second speech, sorry, not your second speech, <laughs> your fourth speech, your special occasion speech, please get that to me as soon as possible and enjoy your break. I'll see you on Wednesday next week. We're gonna focus our attention back on rhetorical appeals, which are ethos, pathos, and logos. Have a great day, everyone.
Thanks. You too. Thank you.